Hello and welcome to the Total Clarity Podcast. I'm Jesse Hyatt. And I'm Mike Varley, and this is week 21 of our walk around the city. Wow! That's right, 21 weeks, 105 walks. We are really cooking. We're cooking. That's right. With gas. Yeah. Without gas. We're cooking with, with foot pedaled fire. With foot pedaled <laughs> fire, we are cooking. Yes, 105 marathons we've walked already, which is over 2,000 miles, 20, 2,600 miles, in fact. Over it. That's it's right. more than that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like far over it. That's right? right. Well, with, uh, like with all of our extra mileage that we're counting, we're dutifully keeping in our spreadsheets, we have eclipsed 2,800 miles so far. Woohoo! Yeah. And every five weeks, plus one week, inevitably, we do our mileage report, which this time Jesse has taken the reins on. I have. So she has some surprises for me. Yeah, are you ready? I'm, I'm ready. So okay. for those that haven't heard this before, we are going to break down the mileage that we've traveled over week 16 through 21 and the equivalent city we could have walked to or traveled to as a consequence. Correct. So here we go. Week 16. All right, week 16. Well, I couldn't decide which one I wanted to share with you, so I picked two. Okay. Okay. We could have gone to either Yellowstone National Park. Mm. Have you ever been there? Yeah, isn't it pretty big? It's not really like where where in Yellowstone? Like the center where the dead center. When you Google Yellowstone National Park, the first pin that shows up. Oh, okay. We could have gone there or something that's very accurate. Four Corners. Four Corners. Do you know Why what that is? Why is it very accurate? It's the very spot where oh, the four I states see. come yes, together. Yes. Have you been there? Yes. I have not been there, no. I was there once. Yeah. Yeah, it was What fun. did you do? Did you do a little dance? I stood dance? in the four corners. No, you can't really dance because you have to have four limbs planted at the same time. You could totally break dance. Well, I don't know how you to crab do that. Walk. <laughs> you crab walk? Um, yeah, like that's a good... Well... Okay, I guess I miss, it's a missed opportunity. Um, I just posed for the picture. It was fun. Do you think somebody's played Twister right in that At spot? At the Four Corners? Yeah, it seems like a good place to do it. Yeah, I don't see why not. I don't see why not. <laughs> okay. So that was week 16. Yeah. Oh, and that was 2,096 miles. 2,096 miles. Yeah. Wow. And then the next week, week 17 was 2,207 miles, and we could have walked to Salt Lake City, Utah. Ooh. Have you ever been there? I haven't been anywhere in the Southwest. Oh, okay. Have you been there? I actually can't remember. I think so. You're just such a jet setter or a car setter. Yeah, we would have flown and then drove. Yeah. I don't remember it, though. I mean, I've been to Utah somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, moving on, week 18, 2,358 miles, Missoula, Montana. Oh, famous for? Missoula's. <laughs> I, I actually don't know. They have sound, it was sounded very familiar, though. It's like from a movie or from a book or from they make something there. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard of Missoula, Montana. But you don't remember why either? No. Maybe it's from The Wizard of Oz. Oh, that's an interesting one for it's you to say. <laughs> she goes to Kansas, but mm, we'll figure it out. Somebody will Google it for us maybe. Oh, if you know what Missoula, Montana is reminding us of, you could tell us in the comments. Moving on. Week 19. Week 19. <laughs> Uh, 2,489 miles. <laughs> this is, I've never noticed how you say mileage <laughs> or numbers. 2,450 and eight miles. It's like how you write it on a check. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I always say it that way or if it's just right now. Durango, Mexico. Ooh. Tell me about Durango. Durango is where they make the cars. The Durango. I don't think that's true. Isn't there a car named Durango? Yeah. It's named after Durango, Mexico. 
I don't know if that's even true. Someone drove one car to Durango, Mexico. They broke down, and then some people from Durango, Mexico fixed the car using parts that they had, and they made it look all different. And then they said, we will call this new car Durango. So when you picked these areas, <laughs> did you just, yeah. you just liked the name? I like the and name. And you didn't think, like, maybe while I'm on Google, I'll just go and check and see. No, see, here's what happens. I usually, oh, like, check what the place is about? Yeah, just... A little fun, a little context. Didn't think to do that at all. Yeah, it doesn't seem like. It. <laughs> also, I just kind <laughs> just of make up lies about the Wizard of Oz and Durango cars. It's, I mean, I'm entertained. I call them my stories. Yeah. Rather than my lies. Mm. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on to week twenty. Week twenty. Two thousand and six hundred <laughs> and twenty miles. Yes. Mexico City, Mexico. Whoa. That's a big one. And that's nice for the 100th week. That seems like if you had some sort of big celebration, you'd want to go to a big party in Mexico City, Mexico. I've always wanted to go there. I never yeah. went there. Yeah. One time I thought about asking you if you'd want to go there with me. And what happened? <laughs> well, I think we went somewhere else. Oh, okay. But I like planned out a whole trip and thought this could be fun to go here and then I ended up planning out a whole nother trip and then we went somewhere else but I actually don't remember when or where that was. Mm. Maybe when we went to the Dominican Republic. Maybe. Anyway, Mexico City, Mexico is where we could have ended up at the end of week 100. I mean at the end of walk 100, week 20, um, if we had done that kind of walk. Definitely sounds like it could be some sort of international peace envoy. Or something. 100 mm. marathons from New York to Mexico, to Mexico City. Mexico City, yeah. yeah. Well, are New York and Mexico City sister cities? No. Or is that what they're called? Like when a city is a... That's correct. Like why are they even that? They're super friendly with each other or something? Or they're like similar? Uh, I don't know if you can have multiple sister cities or not. Probably. But I believe Does... Paris is New York's sister city. Oh, that makes sense. What is Mexico City's sister city? Missoula. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So week 21, we're going to, I guess we'll just do a repeat because we also, if you've noticed from the Instagram page, uh, we've already posted what 21 weeks is. Yeah, we did because we were excited. We were very excited. You about want, it. Why were we so excited? Because I think it's like captures imagination. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. But, I mean, what was, where did we go? I'm just trying to build it up. Where did we go, Mike? Well, why don't you tell us? What? We made it all the way across the country. That's right. From New York to L.A. From New York to L.A., Los Angeles, the two big cities of the United States. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, 21 weeks, 105 marathons, and... Now we're going to turn around, <laughs> go back the other way. That would be, that would be the plan. Yeah. <laughs> we don't stop. Can't stop, won't stop. But it definitely, yeah, we posted the picture and, and a lot of people seem pretty excited about it. I think it's, yeah, I think it, it really hits home how long we've been walking. Yeah. Because, you know, a cross-country walk is a thing that's part of the imagination of people, the idea of being able to conquer the entirety of uh, the continent. And yeah. it's, yeah, it is a part of fables and definitely a thing that people do regularly. And there's, you can go online and find out, you know, ways to do it and the history yeah. of people that have done it. And so. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of people that have done the cross country walk. And it's interesting, there's more people that have done that than have done like, city-based walking around there's something about the like traveling in a straight line from one destination to another that seems to get people going yeah well there's i don't know we could tackle that one day what the differences are we could there's yeah different just totally different logistics, totally different sense of adventure, totally different challenges, and totally different easier things to each of them. 
Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. So that's the uh, mileage recap. That's our mileage for recap. For the next four to five weeks. I like this mileage recap. I like talking about it, and I like looking at how far we could go. Yeah. I mean, you just said it, but... It, yeah, it would just be such a different experience if we were walking across the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It would involve, like, camping and carrying a bunch of heavier stuff and not being in our house and being really away from people. But I also don't think it would be possible during COVID. It is a completely different thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's not our project. Yeah. But part of our project is seeing what our mileage ends up looking like in that way so that people can visualize yeah. it. Yeah. We're going to have to start pretending we can walk on water soon. Is that the plan? I think so. Yeah. I don't know when we arrive in Europe. I haven't even looked yet. Maybe we can arrive already. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess the idea with that would be that we'd have, I don't think we can walk on water, but maybe we have like big boats on our feet. Or maybe there's just a boat and we're just walking, you know, on the boat. Oh, and the boat is moving. Maybe it's like an elliptical, like a boat that's moved by an elliptical. I don't know. Do you know what an elliptical is? Uh, that machine that you that you walk on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. It's like. How fast would a boat have to be going to make it so that it was? Like, consistently, well, then that doesn't work at all because you'd be going the same speed as the boat. But there, maybe there's, there's like some way where you, yeah. I guess if, I guess if the boat was moving. Double, oh, wait, 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 no. Like, what? like an, uh, an airplane walkway and walking against it at exactly the speed of your, uh, pace so you could stand you could be in place but you would be walk you know what I'm was saying? an airplane oh like a treadmill like the walkways at the airport yeah like a treadmill sure but backwards yeah and then that would be on the boat and then it would be moving at the same <laughs> speed. yeah just really <laughs> overcomplicating this I think that that works, though. Yeah. I think we figured it out. All right. So okay. by the time we have our next <laughs> update for mileage, we'll be sure to come up with some sort of plan we'll for We'll know how uh, it works. Yeah. yeah. Turning the page. Week, Moving on. Week 21. This is our second week and our second stint in Queens. Uh-huh. Last week was the graveyards of near Queens, which... As we said last week, for those faithful listeners, you'll be getting at a later date. Yeah. Last week we did an election update. But we are in Queens again. And this is the road to Fort Totten. Yeah. Fort Totten, for those that are unfamiliar, is a park that was formerly owned by the federal government as a military base mm -hmm. up until the 1990s, at which point it was turned over to the city and the city has distributed it to various organizations, including the FDNY, NYPD, first responders, and a couple of nonprofits, which we'll get to in a second. And before that, it also had a history as being privately owned by several different families. Mm -hmm. And our trip this week was to walk to there, which was, in fact, half a marathon, basically. Yeah. About, about 13 miles or so. Do a little loop and then head back down to the Jamaica area, at which point we take a train home. That's right. So it was a really nice park. It was. It really was. Yeah, it's, uh, well, can I say also the history of it is that Previous to being privately owned, it was also owned by Native American people. Mm -hmm. Or it was lived on by Native American people. Sure. Um, so that's the full story then, mm -hmm. at least as far as we know. Yep. But yeah, it's this great park that is a little peninsula. 
that juts out into the bay? <laughs> the bay. No, there's a, I don't recall the bay offhand that is right there. Yeah, I can't remember right now. But it's the strip of water that's between Queens and Long Island. So I'm going to look it up neck. while you keep talking. Wonderful. So it's like, it's actually a really interesting view from there because you look out and you can see houses really not far away at all. And that's Great Neck, which is Long Island, mm -hmm. Nassau County. That's correct. And then that's if you look straight out. And then if you look to your left, which was, I guess would be like your north westish, you're seeing the Bronx mm -hmm. and you're seeing two bridges, one of which is the Throg's Neck, which goes over to the Bronx, one of which is, do you remember? Which the other bridge? bridge? Mm. That's fine. There's two bridges. One is the Throg's Neck. One is the, the Whitestone. One... Is it the Whitestone? That's further off in the yeah. distance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, I don't know, maybe... And it's Little Neck Bay or Little Bay. Okay. There's two separate bays there. A Bay Bay. And yeah, the, you can see Great Neck and it's like very much the original Gold Coast era mm -hmm. housing. And it's funny to think about how we talk, we'll probably talk about this next week even, but historically the quote unquote country in New York City and like how where we were standing was country and obviously it's not yeah. country anymore. And then you could see across the bay and that was country for a period of time and it's not anymore. Yeah. And it just continually expanded further and further. Yeah, it's really interesting to think about the the people that owned that land prior to the government owning the land. It was their country house. It was like their farmhouse and their country house. There were, there were people that worked in Manhattan, but then would like, yeah, like as if people, like how people vacation and weekend upstate now, mm -hmm. they would just like go to Queens. It was the Willits family estate for 20 years. And then the estate of, I can't remember, I mean, Lozier was one of the names. Mm. There were two other names there as well, which I don't recall offhand. But There's they were- There's only so much we can take in. It's, we, we had the pleasure of meeting with a man named Paul, who run, is the president of the Bayside Historical Society, which is located at Fort Totten, mm -hmm. and Paul gave us so much really informa uh, really incredible information about the location and about the fort and about what goes on there now and what happened before and about those families and showed us around. And I feel like, I mean, just in general in New York, there's so much to take in. And yeah. my brain, like I can only remember so much yeah don't be too disappointed in us paul we're sorry <laughs> well yeah but we uh we actually intend to have paul on the podcast several months from now when we go back to that area for another trip to queens yeah so and that's when we can get like the real details the hard recorded dirt. and then we'll know for sure that we have the true facts yeah Right now, we're spitballing. Right. And this is just from what we can remember. That's right. But the the only thing that escapes me is the family names, really. That it was, well, as Jesse mentioned, it was Native American land. And then it came under the possession of the Dutch. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think it was specified by Paul whether it was, you know, acquired like Manhattan was acquired or taken over. It's It was... I don't think he specified. I don't remember now. No, but there are a number of archeological digs that have occurred in the area and part of the historical society's, uh, I guess, educational curriculum is to have kids come and like see what these, they have like mock-ups of architect, ar archeological digs. It's cool. Yeah, it was. We got to see, we got a little tour of the historical society and got to see what, what the kids would see when they come on these field trips and 
Yeah, it was fun. Like I, it made me feel like a kid walking in there and looking at it. I could imagine just how fun that would be. Yeah. And they, yeah, they had like diorama set up and like But like big di like like child size diorama that would make the kid feel like they're actually like in the dig mm -hmm. seeing and then it wish it showed the different levels of the ground of like what you might find up top. It would be more recent things and then each level below was from different eras. Right. Back. And so that was in the building that was the military, the engineer corps, the, uh, the building that the army, the army engineer corps. Yeah. In the Bayside Historical Society? The Bayside building? Historical Society is the former military engineer corps building. Yeah. And it... And it was a library as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it looks like a castle. It's really cool. Yeah. If you go on our Instagram, you can see a picture of it. I put it up as a 360 video or a 360 picture. So there's that. And after it was acquired, so, uh, you know, it was in possession of this, these families that I, I can't recall for, I, mean, I think, over a century at least. And then it was acquired by the Willits family, and there's Willits Boulevard, which is leading right up to it, which we walked on quite a bit this week. And that was in that family for 20 years until he, the um, patriarch of the family passed away. And I don't know if there, I think maybe it was in the city's possession for a little bit, or yeah. I don't think it, I don't think it went straight to the military, but uh, in in fairly short order, it went to the military, at which point... I think it went to another family, and then it went to the military. Perhaps. Yeah. And, you know, I think it went to, It doesn't matter. I think it went to the city, <laughs> and then the city sold it to the federal government, but maybe not. Anyway, uh, at that point, it became a military fort, much like Fort Wadsworth, which we visited earlier in Staten Island. And then there's another fort... Um, in the Bronx that we'll be visiting. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you don't really think about it too much, but there are all these forts at strategic locations on the waterways of the city because, you know, as we've referenced a number of times while we've been walking, it's remarkable to think about how much water is a part of this city. And so in the 1860s, coinciding with the Civil War, the federal government undertook a project to build a battery at the shoreline of uh, Fort Totten mm -hmm. during the, in the midst of the Civil War. And according to what Paul was telling us, it was kind of a fiasco. Yeah. As far as um, misappropriation of funds, or at least it was not considered a good use of funds. Well, it sounds like they started building it with the intention of building it four stories tall and then got to the second story and it turned out that there was no use for it anymore? Well, it had become obsolete. Right. The artillery that was being used in warfare at that time made it so that it could penetrate the walls of the battery. Right, so exactly. there was no point to continue. Yeah. But I think even before that, it was considered and not the greatest use of funds. I think something oh. like $250,000 yeah. at the time. And yeah, I don't know whether or not. The idea was that they wanted to have a fort in the Bronx and a fort down there so that they could secure any ships coming through the waterway. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's just funny to think that that was a consideration at some point uh, that, you know, foreign powers could come and invade in that manner, you know? Yeah. Uh, not to say that that couldn't happen at some point now, but it's just, I mean, particularly with the nuclear age, it's like, it's just like a different ball game, whatever modern warfare is. Yeah. Uh, nevertheless, this structure still exists there. And we went on Tuesday and met with Paul and it was locked up. It's locked up because of COVID, and 
we inquired as to whether or not we could potentially get in. And Paul was uh, very generous and said that he would ask the local parks department head if we could get in. Mm -hmm. And so on Friday, we checked in and it was a little bit rainy, which kind of made it iffy as, as to whether or not we could get in. And uh, sure enough, uh, we were able to get the gates unlocked and go yeah. in. Yeah, yeah, and it was so cool. I, I mean, I think partially because it was raining and we were the only ones there, we had the whole battery to ourselves to explore. And again, like, I mean, I guess this park must be really good for kids because, like, again, I just felt like a kid. Like, we could kind of, like, move about it and look out the windows and see the bridge and see the water and and hear the water. It was so quiet. And you could imagine, I mean, it was never used, like you said, but you could kind of imagine being out there a really long time ago and waiting for some sort of battleship to show up from behind those windows. Yeah. If you've ever been to a place like um, like a Fort Lauderdale, you know, or like another, mm -hmm. anywhere with like the Spanish architecture forts, it felt a lot like that. Yeah. It also had a relatively recent pop culture connection during the final season of Game of Thrones. They placed a number of iron thrones around New York City for people to find. And one of them was hidden inside the fort. Oh, it was there? Yeah. Oh, cool. And no, I think it was all over the world. They I put th one. They oh, put and what just one was in New York City? And one oh, just you're right. to be in New York City. Okay, my mistake. But yes, that one was in uh, Oh, cool. Fort I didn't Totten. realize it was there. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Yeah, so that was cool to be in and cool to be there when nobody else was there. And it, we managed to get a lot of 360 footage, which I'd recommend you check out the video for that. It should be out by the time that you're watching this or listening mm -hmm. to this. And yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, once COVID comes out or once COVID is uh, done, They'll be opening it up again. It sounds like for, it was unclear if it was appointment tours or if they just have it going regularly and right. you could just show up. It but, sounded like it was really easy to just find out online and, and get in touch online and, and make it happen. Yeah. Regardless. But yeah. like, yeah, after, like post COVID, like when things are open again. Yeah, so I mean, I would definitely recommend going up there when that was still open, but yeah. even if it were not, it's still a really interesting place to visit. Mm -hmm. It has, you know, aside from this battery that was created, there's also just a lot of, uh, you know, military architecture, like military base architecture. If you've ever been to like a West Point or really a lot of bases from that era, that they, they just have these buildings that feel yeah like they they feel of a place and time and it's really nice to be around and there's a big field in the middle of uh, the park and you know that's where military exercises and marching and things like that would go on this is where the FDNY trains its cadets mm -hmm. so all week we were seeing cadets in various states of doing drills and whatnot even in the rain. Yeah. Which was fun. Which makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to keep going. Yeah. You got to, you, know, you don't get to like not go do the fire thing if it's raining. Right. There's also Army Reserve there. There's police mm -hmm. there, as I mentioned earlier, first responders. And, and they all have their own building. The buildings are in like various states of disrepair, which is kind of interesting. But according to Paul, things are on the upswing as far as getting these buildings rehabilitated. Yeah. So and it was interesting. He was also telling us that in regards to that, the part of the reason that they are in disrepair is because the that park in that area, they're really particular about making sure that things are refurbished to the original quality and like to with 
historical, like using the historical style and materials. That's right? correct. Yes. And it, so it makes it more difficult than a lot of people could could just you can't just like easily toss some new siding up or something. You have to like put the money and put the time and effort into it. Yeah. It seemed I, I asked specifically if it was National Register of Historic Places and it was not. So I don't know. I think it's he was saying that the exterior is more stringent than the interior. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it is not a usual rehab of a building. So, yeah, it yeah. was it was definitely a great place to visit worthwhile for people that like military history, that like parks, people that feel like they've lived in New York and have seen everything in yeah. New York. I mean, even potentially for more ambitious tourists that are looking to say they've done something that not a lot of people do. Sure. Or if you're coming from Long Island. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's pretty close over there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say it's a really interesting spot on the map, too. I think that view out onto the water there, it's definitely a unique view of the city. I mean, I don't know. Could you even see the city from there? I think you could. You can. But it's, and I guess this is something we notice, we've been noticing, and we will continue to notice, I'm sure, Obviously, every time you look at the city from a different neighborhood, you're looking at it from a different angle. But that particular spot, I, for some reason, like as many times as I've looked at the map, I never really realized that there was a point where Queens and the Bronx were so close to each other. Mm -hmm. So that in itself makes it kind of interesting too. It like, I, maybe because I just don't always have a complete sense of direction, like cardinal directions. I feel like when I'm seeing land that I don't expect to be close by, it gives it like completely turns me around in a way that's like not freaky, but just kind of fun. It makes me feel like I'm like placeless for a moment. Mm -hmm. And there's a jetty that's there as well, right before the oh, yeah. main entrance. People were fishing. Yeah, there, are there people... were signs just that said don't go on the jetty, but there were a lot of people on the jetty. A lot of people on the jetty. Every day. It seems like a common fishing spot. Common fishing spot on the shoreline nearby, people digging for shellfish or like, you know, like uh, bivalve shell, like mussels mm. and clams and whatnot. There were, I didn't tell you about this, uh, lots of rats in the jetty. Oh, like, no. Like a lot. Maybe that's why it says not to go on the jetty. Well, people throw their garbage in there, so the rats are, you know, just Ugh. living on the garbage, I presume. But I don't care for that. I know. Yeah. I don't think there's anybody that's, you know, a big fan of the yeah rat trash connection. But <laughs> but it was still a yeah. cool place to walk out to. I wonder if it's particularly bad right now because the rats are really like they're having a hard time. <laughs> Maybe. They are. Haven't you heard? No, I haven't heard. Because of COVID, because the restaurants are not throwing out as much trash as normal. Sure. Tough time to be a rat. Yeah. Yeah. They got to go out to the jetty. <laughs> so Fort Totten, definitely recommended, particularly when COVID's over, go out and check it out. Yeah. But I guess if you're looking for something to do, too. Yeah, it's a great thing to do now, too. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. As for the rest of our walk, there were, I don't know, some highlights here and there, but it was mostly about Fort Totten. Yeah. Well, this, so this route was planned because Fort Totten was this little peninsula that jutted out onto the water and it just like looked interesting, right? And it mm -hmm. didn't really easily fit onto any of the other routes because it was so far. So we called it the Road to Fort Totten. And I kept, I thought it was a nice name because it made it feel almost like it was a pilgrimage or something. Mm -hmm. And did you feel like it was when we were actually doing it at all? 
No. Oh, I'm I... sorry to keep saying no to what you're saying. <laughs> no feelings. Do you know what a pilgrimage is? Yes. Should we read a definition just in case people don't know what a pilgrimage is? I don't know who those people are. A pilgrimage? You don't think any, you think that no everyone knows? I don't know. A pilgrimage is a journey, often into an unknown or foreign place, where a person goes in search of new or expanded meaning about their self, others, nature, or a higher good through the experience. Okay. Well, it was an unknown and foreign place. You obviously had that looked up. There's no way that you couldn't have just... That I was... had it ready and I have pilgrimage ready. I see that. Ready. Yeah. yeah. My notes. Yeah. Tell me, well, tell me more about how your... Tell me about your pilgrimage experience. Well, I, I don't know that... So, okay. I don't know that Fort Totten, the road to Fort Totten necessarily, that in itself felt like a pilgrimage to me. It was a new place. <laughs> For me, uh -huh. <laughs> it was a place I had never been. I was excited to go there. I've been waiting for 20 weeks, and then on week 21, we finally get to go to Fort Totten. And I do feel, though, however, that the entire walk that we're doing, the entire project, could feel like the rest of that pilgrimage description. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, like, actually just wrote the word pilgrimage and thought that you'd have more to say. <laughs> nice. You're just going to alley-oop it to me? That was my plan. Um, we could, I but mean, no, but I do. But I think but I think that even though, I mean, I had you not thought about I I felt like we had talked about it, but maybe I had only thought about it in my own mind or talked to maybe other people about it when I described the road to Fort Totten route. But had you not thought about it like that? No, I thought about, what like, a military think? movie. Sounds like the title of a military oh. movie. The Road to Fort Totten, starring, uh, I don't know, Steve McQueen. Like that movie that we watched that was all in one shot. Uh, 19... 18. 18. Um, no. I don't, I don't, I mean, that 1918, 1918 and The Road to Fort Totten are, it might not be 1918. 1918 but, is when the last pandemic was. Yeah. Anyway, that is just a date. The Road to Fort Totten's yeah. like The Road to Iwo Jima. Have you ever heard of that movie? No. That's a war movie. Anyway, Pilgrimage, yes. I, I mean, I think retroactively it'll be very easy to describe how what we're doing is a pilgrimage. Yeah. Right now when I think of a pilgrimage, I think of going to a specific place, observing it, and going back. We're not doing that right now. However, no. it is a pilgrimage of some type, but I'm not sure on the spot if I could identify what it is or if I'll be able to identify it until we're even done. Yeah, I mean, the pilgrimage is, it's usually, I agree, it's usually going to one specific spot and then leaving right away. And I feel like our version of the pilgrimage here, New York City is like our Mecca. Like, we're just instead of going to it and leaving, we're like staying in it and moving about it and exploring every little crevice. And each day is its own pilgrimage to something special. Yeah, possibly. Again, when I think of pilgrimage, I think of a thing you do once in your life. You experience it. Oh, you think it, it happens once in your life? I don't, it's not, I don't, Typically, think it's no. It is a. It's a thing that people save up and generate a lot of intention in their heads for. Then they have that experience, and then they reflect on it for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Typically, but I, again, could see potentially how what we're doing could be described as a pilgrimage. But also, you don't really live in the place you pilgrimage. No, you don't usually. I'm not trying Let's to challenge you. the second you. half of the definition again. Okay. Where a person goes in search of new or expanded meaning about their self, others, nature, or a higher good through the experience. Yeah. I mean, that's... I think all of that is applying. I guess one thing that I've been saying a lot, I don't think I've said it on the podcast yet. Maybe mm -hmm. I have. You don't know where I'm going. But one thing I've been saying to you and to other people a lot in the last couple of weeks is that I do feel like with all the shit that's going on in the world, 
normally I would be like a ball of anxiety right now. I'd be very uncomfortable in my body. I'd have a lot of like physical nervous energy flowing through me. Mm -hmm. And this walk, I've been really noticing that I don't feel that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that is maybe what's making me feel like there might be some sort of relationship to the idea of a pilgrimage because now we've been walking for about 2,800 miles. And one thing that I've found within myself is that there, I have the ability to keep that at bay and that that energy can like flow in and out and leave right away. Yeah. And that's kind of a major thing to discover. Yes, that's great. Is there anything else you want to unpack about pilgrimages right now? Mm -mm. Thank you. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So another thing that was interesting about this trip is that I've been sick starting Wednesday. Yeah. Not COVID. Don't it's, worry. It's not COVID. Lots of mucus. <laughs> what? I, I wasn't planning on sharing that aspect of it. Well, it's an important aspect. I've do, been doing a lot of Googling and everyone says mucus is not a COVID thing. Oh. Mucus is a cold. Yeah. Well, I knew it was a cold because my entire life experience suggested to me that it's a cold. And it started with a, I, well, I guess really Thursday and Friday were the days that for properly I've been sick. So two marathons walking around with a cold. I had uh, just a pain in my throat and generally feeling fatigued. On Thursday morning, I had a dream before I woke up asking an HR representative if I could call in sick, <laughs> which... We don't have one of those. We don't have one. Uh, I was trying to figure out if I could still get paid for taking a sick day. <laughs> you can get paid the exact amount Yeah. that you would be getting paid. Yeah. But... So you don't get your points. No. It wasn't too bad. Today was honestly the worst day of feeling sick, which I guess that's good that it coincided with a quote-unquote day off. Yeah. Well, I think your body knows. Maybe. Maybe it does. But just general sore throat and, uh, yeah, runny nose. Um, and it was, I'm, I mean, Wednesday when and I got home. Sneezy. You're like this, the second dwarf sneezy. Mm -hmm. Wednesday when I got home, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday it rained. So I was cold and wet on Wednesday. And I think that was maybe why it happened i don't know so it was it's not as challenging as maybe one would think hopefully by monday it's gone though because it's not really particularly pleasant although this morning i didn't want to do anything so hopefully you know now i was able to record the podcast so uh but yeah i mean interesting like everything else to have to do something like this while you're not feeling well yeah so that's a worthwhile experience. Do you think it makes it harder to walk? I don't know if I would have been able to walk today. Today, it's, it's also like, fr you know, yesterday, Friday, we went to a friend's house and stayed out later, even though I wasn't feeling well. And so kind of had limited sleep. And I think that played a role as to why I wasn't feeling great today. Mm. If I had to walk the next day, I would have gone to sleep earlier. And like, yeah. It just would have been do, different circumstances. Yeah. Do you also, though, have the experience where sometimes when you're a little feeling sick and then if you don't have the time to be sick, your body just, like, deals with it? Like, do you ever have that experience? That's yeah, a very common thing for me. Yeah, sure. Yes, we do share yeah. a common experience this episode. <laughs> Wonderful. Finally, I've been looking for it. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> so, yeah, I I hope that this, as I said, I hope it won't persist into Monday. Yeah. I If it will, it'll be significantly improved. Yeah, and we'll load you up with tea. That's what I've been doing. Yeah. Elixirs and tea, all the liquids. Yeah. The chicken. Chicken. We just had the chicken. We did have some chicken. Yeah. 
Yeah. I feel great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I do. I hope that continues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, me too. No. Um, and another thing about this week, it was nice to see the leaves falling. Oh, yeah. It's been beautiful. Yeah. Aside from the, th the first two days were magically beautiful. The last three days have been rainy most of the time. Yeah. But there was a string of like, you know, seven days or so that were very sunny and beautiful. And it was really something to be out in the city and just have a constant falling of leaves like it was snowing. I think a lot of times when you think about the leaves falling, it's in the context of like making a trip to see the leaves fall upstate or seeing the leaves fall for like a fleeting instance of time mm -hmm. while you're on your way to work or if you decide to go to a park for like a couple hours or something, but not like having it be just the fabric of your day yeah. for multiple days in a row. Yeah. And I think, honestly, we're probably not going to see it again. I think that the fact that we had that string of five to seven nice days in a row mm. gave the leaves the opportunity to fall at like, an, I don't want to say natural because it's all natural, but just at... At like a nice, beautiful, slow pace. Yeah, a different type of cadence. And now with the, the rain, I think it really just lopped off a third of the leaves because yeah. it was raining and windy. So, but I'm glad that we got to experience that. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, yeah. And there was one moment though when I looked up to really admire it and I got hit in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I also walked into a stick. Yeah, you did. I was walking and uh, it went right into my eye. Fortunately, Fortunately, I was wearing contacts, so I think that, that may have helped. Yeah, but it would it was... have been better if you were wearing glasses, though. You say that as you're wearing glasses, and it's like... I'm wearing it today. Yeah, right now you're wearing glasses. That's correct. So I guess it... your options, because you have to wear one or the other, is glasses or contacts. Mm-hmm. I... It probably would have been better if you were wearing glasses. But it's better than not wearing anything. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. It freaks me out. I'm sorry. I'm just <laughs> feeling a little upset. No. I don't think there's anything more I want to say about the route for this week. We... Oh, I want to say something. What? We saw parakeets. That's true. In front, and they were in front of just one house. That's right. And we texted our friend Tim, who's an avid birder, and he said that there's a lot of parakeet colonies in the city, or a number of them, if some and that must have been one of the colonies and but it was just interesting that they were every time we walked by this one house mm -hmm. the tree in front of it had parakeets either flying in or out yeah yeah it was cool to see yeah they be, particularly because again it was this one tree yeah that seemed to be a natural magnet for them yeah I guess another quick shout out to the neighborhoods of Jamaica Estates and Holliswood. Oh, yeah. They're Fancy. really interesting neighborhoods nearby the Jamaica like train station area that were very nice big houses with lawns and, uh, you know, I don't know how much money they were, but they seem like they were pretty uh, ritzy, ritzy houses. Out of my budget. Out of your budget. Probably. Out of your budget relative to you know, them being in a New York City location. I don't know, like, if they were in another city or they were oh, in the suburbs, like, sure. I don't know. they are, they, they weren't, like, you know, palaces. No. They were just really nice homes. And also just kind of, you know, they didn't adhere to the grid structure. Yeah, it was an interesting curved roads and, like, a little bit of hilliness. Yeah. It just, yeah, it felt like walking around. I mean, it actually felt a lot like walking around Staten Island in certain areas, where, mm -hmm. like, near the parks. And then it also felt a lot like walking around some of the, like, nicer neighborhoods with cul-de-sacs near where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So that's... And it was fall. It kind of felt like we were trick-or-treating. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that's, I think, all we're going to tackle for the route for this week, with, of course, Fort, Fort Totten being the, the focal point of it. Yes. But we yes. wanted to save some time for a part of our project that's entering a new phase as of this Thursday. Yeah. Which is the release of our dichotities. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you that don't remember or haven't heard of them before, dichotities are this idea that we have for our clothing where we do screen printing of phrases that are very similarly worded but arranged in such a way that they have very different meanings. Mm -hmm. So our first one, which was in the spring, which we didn't get to roll out because of COVID, was you are not your thoughts versus all we are is thought. Yes. And then in the summer, we actually didn't do one in favor of having our unreported shirts, mm -hmm. which is part of our use of force series that we're, that's ongoing about different instances of police use of force in various spots along our walk routes. And now we have the fall version, which is the community is endless mm -hmm. versus a community of edges. That's right. And so we've had uh, sweatshirts. Jesse and I have had sweatshirts yeah. that we've made that we've uh, been wearing as we've been walking around. Mm -hmm. And it was always a plan to have events, which obviously is not part of the COVID plan, no. and then sell t-shirts or printings of these dichotities at the events. And so now we're finally ready to figure out basically a distribution rollout strategy. And so, yeah, you want, now that I've just kind of given all the preamble in the world, do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so we've pulled, we have this stock of t-shirts that we bought five years ago for a different project from a company called Alternative Apparel, which is a U.S.-based company. And we pulled out two colorways from that box of shirts that we have, and we've put them aside for this particular run of dichotities. And we've chosen colors that we think will look nice on those, but we haven't actually printed them yet. So the way that it'll work is that I've done some Photoshop mock-ups of what they would look like printed, and then people can choose their color mm -hmm. and choose their size and then order it, and then we'll print it. And so the reason for that is to keep everything low waste and only do only put the printing work into the pieces that are actually printed and it makes it like an edition so it'll be the first edition of these two styles and it's just a limited number of shirts and then it's a first come first serve situation and we'll probably do a second edition at some point too but this is this is the first one and then in addition in addition to that addition uh we have something called highly valued mm -hmm. which is a repeat of mike's sweatshirt that he wears once a week in the fall and it's also from alternative apparel but we only have three of that exact sweatshirt and those I actually did print already because they're very specific. And then we also have one item which is called Highly Vintage. And that is a repeat of the sweatshirt that I wear, which is a vintage sweatshirt that we got while we were doing our uh, shopping for our uniforms. And I knew the, the color sweatshirt that I wanted for my uniform and I got this one and then I got another one in case I messed it up and so I didn't mess it up and so we have one highly vintage sweatshirt available yes you can see we really like playing with words 
So highly valued, highly vintage. Yeah. We're going to be seeing if those things stick, if people like them. But the basic idea is with the highly valued stuff, these are things that are never going to be made again. Mm -hmm. We have a certain amount of them. With the highly vintage, it's taking clothes that already exist that we've purchased and applying our mark on them. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be displaying very transparently how much everything costs. That's a really important thing for us. We, because it's not just about making the clothes. I mean, if that's not already apparent, because we are going to be, for you know, for the foreseeable future, making them to order. Yeah. Not just making extra things and then having there being waste. We also think that it's important and want to make our work be representative to people of what it takes to actually make clothes. You know, I was in uh, uh, Jamaica, Queens this week and uh, I almost, it almost feels like a confessional, you know, but yeah, I had to I had to buy a, a scarf because I was sick, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And I thought it was going to rain all day, so I didn't bring a scarf. But then, of course, the rain immediately stopped and I could feel my throat like, you know, getting battered by the wind. So I went into a rainbow and bought a pashmina scarf uh, for seven dollars. Mm -hmm. And the pashmina scarf was, by the end of the day, already pilling uh, on my hat. So, you know, we all Probably want... Probably not the best quality. Yeah. yeah. We all want these things. You know, they have shirts there on the rainbow or, you know, like out on the, out on the sidewalk. They'll be like one ninety nine for a shirt. There is no way that that was made in a responsible manner. Yeah. And what we want to do with this... That the dichotomies and with any of the clothing that we're going to be moving forward with in the future is show how much things cost so that even if people don't buy these shirts, they start getting an understanding of what costs actually are. Yeah. I think it's, com I, uh, you know, we're, our, our concept behind it is that it's compelling and educational even if it doesn't necessarily result in people purchasing things. So. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very it's very important to me and it's very important to you. And it's how we've decided to clothe ourselves for this entire year. Every single item of clothing, which if you've been on our website, you can also see is labeled next to it where we got it and on what tier of our value system with clothing it falls. And yeah, it's like it's not impossible to do that. It takes a little more work to kind of take the effort to think about where your clothing is coming from. and But it also, it takes some knowledge so we can be uh, conveyors of that knowledge. Yeah. And part of also why I want to show the breakdown is because certain things like the where we're getting, we want to get all of our materials from reasonable places. We don't want to be just ordering bulk shirts from China or something where, you know, all of the clothing is either vintage or made in the U.S. And actually the newer stuff that we're getting is made not only in the U.S., but locally in between Pennsylvania and Long Island, which is funny because it's where we're, where we're from. Mm -hmm. And it's where we were made. Yeah, well, I was going to say that, but I actually was born in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> anyway, and you were born in Brooklyn. Uh, that's true, but that's on Long Island. That's true. And it's where you were, you know, you were assembled. Oh, yeah, like my brain growing and stuff. Yeah, yeah. whatever. Um, <laughs> but that's where the shirts, the new, the newer shirts. So first edition number two will be from Royal Apparel instead of Alternative Apparel. Yeah. But anyway, some of the costs end up being a little bit more than they would be if you were just going for the cheapest available option. And then our labor is what it is. And yeah, I hope it's interesting for people. It's very interesting for me. I really love talking about it and showing it and 
I hope that, yeah, I hope that it's something that people are interested in looking at. Yeah. Well, circling back to the scarf, I mean, you know, the tier structure that we have for our clothing start, you know, it goes as, you know, as high as a reuse and things that we've already had. Uh, and then at the bottom is functional necessity, right, which includes the shoes. And in this particular instance, it's in order for me to maintain health so that we can continue walking, I needed to purchase sure. this scarf for the yeah. time. But how this relates to what we're doing here is that, you know, we also recognize that, it, you know, we're not s militantly into what we're doing. I don't, I, that is to say, like, there are certain classes of people that are puritanical in whatever their beliefs are. And ultimately, I'm less about trying to get people to make it so that every piece of their clothing is at that top tier of, of reuse or, 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 you know, like union made, you know, you know, the name of the person that stitched the sleeve onto your shirt. Yeah. But more about like, if you're just thinking about this, then you will naturally start, you know, organizing things based on it's like, well, you know, I, I need this functionally. I need this right now. And that's just where it is. And I am going to bring this type of decision making to every clothing purchase. Yeah. You know? And it can go beyond clothing, too. I mean, I well, sure. Once you start thinking about things in this way, you apply it to kitchen goods and beauty products and uh, whatever else you buy, like every single thing that you buy, this, these metrics can be applied to. And then, you know, it also can be, it can be a challenging thing to start doing as well because it takes time to sort of research where things are coming from. It takes a certain level of um, financial ability to not simply just choose the cheapest thing. But I also think it has the potential to curtail on unnecessary spending at the same time. Because if you're just going to Rainbow, for example, to do like a fun shopping trip, you might just like not do that. <laughs> Where you might go and you might spend $25 and get a whole bag of stuff that you may or may not need or want. You might not do that and then you might have an extra $25 to spend on something that makes you feel good and makes other people feel good and is, you know, contributing to. Or you go to a Salvation Army and have a fun time. Sure. You know, Where things are actually things probably that... about the same price and yeah. yeah. I mean, there's plenty of ways to look at it. Yeah, and I, I mean, if people are able to extrapolate this clothing tier structure to other parts of their life, you know, awesome. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I find it hard to extrapolate this to everything because, it's you know, we're just humans, you know. Yeah. But, oh, and I think, yeah, I mean, there's no pressure. I'm, I'm really into it. And I've also been into it for... Uh, like 15 years, <laughs> like since I was a teenager. So I have a leg up on this. So if you're just starting out, if this is your first introduction, welcome. No pressure to, to make this your whole entire life. Yeah. So that covers our thinking as far as the merchandise itself. But then there's the specific fall dichotities phrases. Mm -hmm. a, the community is endless and a community of edges. Which one do you want to talk about? Well, the one on my shirt that I wear every week is a community of edges, mm -hmm. which I go back and forth on feeling like it makes a lot of sense to wear that shirt and then also feeling like sometimes it doesn't feel like I need to wear that shirt. Mm -hmm. kind of depends on where we are in the political climate mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our original pairing was actually different. It was the community is endless and this community is ending. It's true. And 
we sat with that for a while and came to the conclusion that it was more negative than what we wanted. Yeah. Even though I think it does have some resonance as a phrase. It does. I think, though, like, I definitely think that this community is ending is a phrase that people often say, especially in New York, like people that have been here a long time, where they're sort of, I mean, I don't think they say that specific phrase, but they say that idea. And it actually just kind of is such a bummer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's kind of like what, you know, people, a lot of people have been saying it about New York right now, like New York's over, New York's dead. This community is ending. And it's just not true. Yeah. Like, if that's your attitude, then that's your attitude, but it's not like, that's just your attitude. Yeah. And then, yeah, we realized, like, I don't want that on a shirt. Yeah. But I mean, a community it... of edges, it has a similar feeling, like there's still a negative quality, but there's also, it's kind of unclear to me what exactly it means. Like when I wear it, I think it's not, it's not saying that it's not a community of walls, right? Like people can come in. It might mean that everybody has their elbows out. Like that would be a community of edges. Like we're all tough guys or something. Um, but it could also mean that there's like a protection, like about like, like there's some sort of like boundary that will hold you in place or like there's something to sharpen your community. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot more ways to think about it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to I don't want to say everything that I've ever thought about it yet because I also want to give people an opportunity to think about what these phrases mean for themselves. Right. Yeah. I think of edges, a community of edges in a like um, celebratory like community of misfits type way. People that have chips on their shoulder. I think of edge and a chip. And uh, but also people that are maybe feisty, willing to fight, people that have principles, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think that the design itself is pretty strong. I, do I mean, too. obviously, I'd hope that we'd be putting out something that we think has a strong design. <laughs> but you know, the X shape with from a distance, you're not entirely clear that it actually is a phrase until you get closer. Yeah, and that's actually true of both designs. I think that we did that on purpose with this particular set, is that they look visually appealing like they could just be an abstract shape. Yes. And then when you get closer, you realize it actually said something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that would pivot us to The Community is Endless, the one that's on my sweatshirt, which is shaped like a city skyline and reflects the journey that we are taking, which is to say that we are, as a city, made up of 100 plus neighborhoods, but ultimately it is very clear when you're walking around that the lines blur mm -hmm. to the point where the community has no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I think about it even in terms of more specific communities, I think it could apply to too. You know, we spent September staying in Staten Island at a community that has been around since the 70s and may very well be endless. Mm -hmm. It's still going and people are coming and going and not that it's not the same, but it continues. And New York could be a community that's endless. And even, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be walking along music of Manhattan. And there's these 
songs that are written about specific places that bring people in and they might it might be people that are living across the world but they become part of the community just by listening to that song and that can happen forever so i think there's a lot of ways to think about both of these yeah and we have intended it to be made in such a way that people put their own spin on what the meaning is yeah so the design might be something that appeals to you more the words might be something that appeals to you more we want people to make decisions for their clothes that are more informed and involved than what they're used to with typical just do it nike shirts or I mean, joke shirts things like that so yeah that's where we're at right now yeah and as you may have heard just now the heat is coming on in this room <laughs> oh, i wonder if this picks it a up. new yeah. phenomenon as we enter our colder months phenomenon that's right <laughs> the sound of heat pipes in our soundproof room yeah i mean it's not a new phenomenon we lived here for four years the heat's really loud <laughs> as far year. as but as far as being in a little recording studio in here as far as recording the podcast the first time yeah. well we'll find out if you yeah, hear we'll or see not how it goes. that does it for this week's episode thanks so much for tuning in uh check out the dichotomy series coming out on thursday two days from today and if you like the podcast as always please uh like it virtually share it with people let people know thanks so much for tuning in and keeping up with us we really appreciate the support and until next time take care bye Bye.